Hello, heroes. I am the game master for Young Heroes of Fate, Zach Hall. I uh, we missed this past week between issue six and this upcoming week, issue seven. And posted on Twitter, what did you guys want to hear from me as kind of like a makeup for having to miss a session? A lot of you guys wanted some kind of behind the scenes. GM stuff and uh, most of you wanted kind of a summary of episodes one through six and I thought perfect I'll do both at the same time full disclosure I recorded this video yesterday but didn't check all of my audio levels beforehand because I was sick and working from home and uh, uh, recorded a 20-25 minute video with no audio so if this video has audio and you're seeing it, this is already better. Round two. So to start out with, Young Heroes of Fate is a super... I'm, I've been calling it a super powered Fate Core game. We uh, use the Fate Core system from Evil Hat Productions plus the Venture City supplement. We use that supplement to handle our character's superpowers. The game takes place in 2008. Because I, I am, that's when I went to high school, was the mid-2000s. And, you know, I was, I was born in 1990. I was, uh, lived under a rock until essentially 2004, 2005. And so I really missed pop culture before then. My parents did not hand down any kind of their young culture like I didn't grow up listening to my parents generation of music like 70s or 80s I didn't even really even grow up watching seven 70s or 80s television or music or movies and so when I see uh retro gaming most of the time that's taking place in like the 70s or 80s and a lot of people have strong feelings with those decades and feel a heavy sense of nostalgia or man, I was born in the wrong decade. I don't feel any of that connection to either one of those decades, even though I have now started to go back in my adulthood and really enjoy a lot of those things. Nostalgia is just not tied to me in, in those periods of time, but I have a hella amount of nostalgia tied to just a decade 15 years ago mainly music and it's the the rise and peak potentially depending on who you talk to a pop punk and you might know that about me if you realized what i was naming our episodes after wink wink easter egg if you want to go track all that down uh anyway uh uh uh, additionally, just for the game's sake, placing a placing our game in 2008 means that we get a lot of the benefit of modern day society. Things like access to the internet, communication like cell phones, text messages, emails, without the it being ambivalent or not ambivalent ubiquitous to the experience of everyone so you could still have family members that have only landlines and parents that don't use cell phones you can have kids that uh don't have unlimited minutes or unlimited text messages and so it puts as a game master it's awesome to be able to put uh caps and potentially stress points on the player's resources like how many minutes have you used this month on your cell phone plan? You've run out of minutes talking to friends and, or you, maybe you're on a family plan and you now can only make calls after seven o'clock. Maybe you have a nights and week, unlimited nights and weekends plan. Uh, only, only 2000 kids know what I'm talking about. Or you have a max, maybe your parents have a max of like 200 text messages per line and you used them all in a one conversation with your, you know, work buddy or your study partner 
or gossiping with your girlfriend about something. And so you now no, no longer have text messages. Or if you do, there might be a consequence. Like the phone bill comes at the end of the month and you get, <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know, punished by a, a family member for, you know, racking up a huge phone bill. So I think 2008 is kind of like that perfect moment for uh, modern society high telling a story with high schoolers being able to say, you have these benefits, but there's going to be uh, a cost uh, or potential stress in using it. If we tried to run a game in modern 2018, I would need to come up with, as a GM, would need to come up with a lot of different ways to keep players isolated when I needed them to be isolated. Or we do the what most movies and TV shows do now is just hand wave away the fact that this episode or this entire movie could have been solved with a text message or one phone call. Well, that loses all the drama. So um, those are a couple reasons why I put the show in 2008 M mainly selfish reasons of nostalgia the game takes place in a fictional city uh along the atlantic seaboard uh it's called crown city it is essentially a fictionalized version of my hometown of charlotte north carolina um again some of it's selfish and wanting to place a game somewhere with uh places that i know it makes it really easy if my players want to go do something and or ask questions about what's available instead of me having to create this brand new city i can say yes this city has a museum or yes this move uh this city has a large international airport things like that i can just pull on my actual experience and memories of my hometown instead of having to like come up with everything and um, as our characters begin to explore the city more and the city becomes uh, a character onto itself, more of the city will be revealed, more of the city will, Crown City will separate itself from real life Charlotte. Um, and that's just, and, and honestly, as a GM, if my, if my characters say, is there a blank? My instinct is to say yes. I, let's see where this, let's see where this goes. All right, so that's backstory. Episode one is the uh, field day at Elizabeth Academy, a public charter school in Crown City that has a very div diverse group of students. It's about 125, 150 students per grade, which equals out to somewhere between um, five, 600 kids total at the school. So not a huge high school by any means, but still large enough to where we have a f big cast and a big pool of individuals that we can create and tap into as our characters begin to explore more and create more relationships. Also allows enough space for our characters to have created their own kind of social group if they wanted to. Um, so a character like Nat, Skype call. Don't know who that is. So a character like Nat, who is heavily involved in things like student council, student government, after school activities, the um, player Christina was able to build out the social group around around Nat and had enough room to where she could do that without having to necessarily chat with one of the other players to see if anything else was, like if there was gonna be any overlap, unless you wanted to. So a benefit to that size of school. Anyway, field day. The idea here behind creating a field day as the very first adventure was I wanted to get the students away on a school-oriented event but away from the city into a more cut off environment, a more remote environment for our capital E event to happen. Um, the event is where something happens to turn 
600 individ a certain percentage of 600 individuals into people with superpowers. Um, and obviously that's what happens to, at the very end of episode one, P is for powers. This is the only, uh, only episode that I didn't name after a song. It is instead named after Grant Morrison's first run of new X-Men comics, which was called E for Extinction, I believe. Uh, really enjoy Grant Morrison's run. And X-Men is obviously a, a huge inspiration for Young Heroes of Fate. So little hat tip to X-Men, Marvel, Grant Morrison, and then the rest of the episodes I've been naming after some of my favorite bands and songs. Um, issue one, we get to see the characters as they were before they got superpowers. So we get to see Nat being super organized. Some characters might even call her bossy, even though she would take real umbrage with that adjective. Get to see Adam being kind of a loner, heavy into comic books, really just trying to... He's a little different than Abby, who is also shy and a loner and super into her books, where Abby, from my perspective, Abby seems to want to create a bubble around herself and really just be left alone. Adam more likes being just on the outside, but still being able to observe what's going around. So we see Adam kind of commenting on and kind of little uh, comments from the peanut gallery on events that happen in the bus, specifically Riley versus Nat, um, where Riley is essentially a breakfast club character leather jacket, heavily independent, um, uh, how do I say this politely? Uh, he is authority figure averse, um, and very kind of wants to be on his own and he's just ready to be out of school and who can blame him, uh, for a lot of people, high school sucked. I can definitely identify with a part of that myself. So, um, Everybody's on the bus. We see, uh, who did I not talk to? Uh, uh, Theo. And Theo's our athlete. He's in, engaged in the school with certain things, but not with everything. So he's got his own social group separate from Nat, from Riley, um, and from, and, and then obviously like Adam and Abby each kind of have their own very small social group. Field day happens. Everybody seems to be having a good time. Everybody gets a chance to kind of do their own thing. We bring them all together for food because uh, one thing I learned working in schools with kids, if you want them to show up somewhere, you feed them. And I mean, it's a school event. You're going to feed them anyway. Totally made sense for me to like, all right, everybody is kind of spread out doing their own thing. Let's bring them back together for lunch bring them in for lunch. And that's when this huge heavy fog rolls in from across the lake and seems to knock everybody out. And this is our capital E event that changes individuals into themselves, but with superpowers. Issue two, everybody wakes up and uh, has to figure out them with superpowers. Uh, Abby has four extra appendages coming out of her back. They are metallic, and she has no idea what's going on. She runs off scared, understandably so. Um, Riley seems to be sharing a body slash possessed slash partnered up with a extra planar being. Very Cthulian. Um, sounds a lot like the... Um, I'm not super read up on Cthulian, so at first, when me and R uh, Riley's player, um, uh, Zippy Zippo, when we first started talking about Riley and his partner, uh, Ogthalic, it sounded very outsiders from uh, Dresdenverse, uh, the Dresden Files by Jim Butcher, which after then kind of reading and talking with Zippy seemed to be very Cthulian inspired themselves. So very cool. Um, and it gives Zippy honestly a chance 
that not many RPG players get a chance to do, which is essentially he gets to play two characters at the same time, which is super interesting. It's fun to see their dynamic. It's almost like a bad buddy cop movie just with those two on that one character sheet. Um, and you kind of get a little bit of that culture out uh, fish out of water storyline with Ogthalic, not totally understanding modern culture. Um, and it's just a super fun, a great sense of levity. And as a GM, I love it because being able to use Ogthalic as a story, a, a pusher of story, being able to spend a fate point to essentially entice Ogthalic and his player with a action or non-action that creates drama, huge huge boon for a GM like me where I'm all about player conversations, player interactions, and those that, those dramatic moments. So Riley and Onkthalic is awesome. Theo for uh, episode two is gone uh, partially because his player Mike was, I believe that's the night that he was finishing up a onstage run with his local theater. And that was awesome. I wanted to give him this player a chance and it totally worked out that essentially Theo turns out to be some distant relation of the Greek god Athena and is essentially a minor demigod and that has been awakened in him and so what I ended up doing was essentially just pulling Theo out of the story he was gone when everybody woke up from the fog and we kind of flash back with him at the very beginning of episode three and where Theo is having a conversation with Athena. Athena is kind of giving him a little bit of information about something's happening. Theo has the opportunity to step in and make a difference and keep people safe, but doesn't really spell out exactly what's happening to him or what's happening on a much big, bigger macro level. And then he's kind of beamed back down in Medius Res via a Bifrost kind of thing. So episode two is just essentially everybody freaking out. Riley is trying to learn how to control Ogthalic, and that doesn't totally go well. Um, Adam is freaking out just because everybody around him seems to be freaking out. And Nat feels normal but we kind of run into an issue where it turns out Nat can essentially tell people what to do and they will do it. She kind of has the power of command, of influence. And so they're on, the st students are all in their buses on their way back to the school when Nat tells, is experimenting with her powers, tells everybody to stand up and everybody in the bus does, including the bus driver and the bus turns over, flips, has an accident. And that's where we end episode two. Episode three, we start with Theo kind of bifrosting, beaming back in into the action. Adam has been thrown from the bus and we learned that his superpower is super healing. His body is literally stitching itself back together. Um, but it turns out it doesn't do it. Uh, he regains full function of everything, but it leaves behind scars. So you can already see um, heavy scarring building up around his arms and shoulders. And he has a lot of scarring on his face from when he went flying through a window. Um, and that was a, a personal choice that um, Daddy Warbucks, the player behind Adam made, that he wanted to play almost a... Um, he wanted there to be a heavy consequence and downside to his his power and explore that so you have someone like theo where his superpowers he he's gonna have drawbacks but it's gonna come more in um things owed like he's been given a power and a responsibility and i'm gonna be able to tug on those lines as a GM to create dramatic moments for Theo, the character with his power. 
but there isn't necessarily a huge downside to him swinging his sword and using his shield. Adam and, and Daddy Warbucks really wanted to explore the consequences of what happens when your mu mutation... I'm, I'm not trying to, like, these aren't mutants per se. I mean, they kind of are. But uh, not really using that to define them. So these powered individuals, what happens when maybe your life isn't better after gaining your powers? Maybe you wish you could just go back to being normal. And I think we're, Adam is one of those individuals who's just like, I wish I could just go back to being a normal 17 year old reading comics in his dorm room and not having to stress about what my, or stressing about what my body looks like, but in a normal teenager guy way, not in a, you know, wearing, he ends up wearing like a gas mask full face in order just to cover up his face because he's embarrassed and doesn't want to be seen as is super cool as a character aspect and something I'm really excited for Adam to explore even more. So bus accident, we spend most of episode three dealing with the bus accident, uh, Theo, Ogthalic, and a NPC named Dylan or Spud as he was nicknamed by Riley. The three of them are, begin using powers to get people off of the school bus at the very end um the bus begins to explode and theo grabs the last person helping getting people off the bus wraps them up and puts his shield in between them and the exploding bus and they go flying 50 feet in the air off of the highway um, it turns out that this person is Abby's mom, who is a teacher at the school. And, um, yeah, consequences. Again, like, our players, our players are very focused right now. Their characters do not want to be seen and they don't want their powers to be visible or their powers to be, uh, public. And so we run into a situation where Theo's seen using his powers. Part of his power set is not any kind of disguise. Um, so he's fully faced. Um, sometimes he wears a helmet, I think. I'd have to double check with, with Mike. But yeah, so uh, there are people that see our students using their superpowers to get away from the bus. Um we run into another pretty large event with Nat and her superpowers where Nat and Theo are fit, are basically thrown into a showdown guns pointed from, uh, uh, from the police, like a SWAT team who have arrived on the scene with reports of explosions and a dude with a sword and a huge black monster in Octalic, um, ripping open a bus. And so they come out fully armed, with their their weapons and nat tells them to go to sleep and the whole swat team falls asleep epic but very public and so the kids go on the run and essentially episodes four five and six are the kids uh in hiding and on the run trying to figure out exactly what their powers do making contact with a couple other students the um we already met Dylan, who's a freshman who has the ability of f becoming invisible and also phasing his body through matter. So he can walk through walls. He can, you know, stick his arm through a door, stuff like that. Um, they've also met up with Divya, one of Nat's friends, who is a junior and she is a uh, fledging mechanic and apparently can speak to machines, like have a conversation and interact with her voice and machines. Um, and then Franklin and another athlete at Elizabeth Academy, um, who can has super agility and can fly. So we now have between Dylan, 
Franklin and Divya, not Dylan. Is that his name? Yes. Dylan, Divya, Franklin, plus our five players. We hit, we have seen eight students with powers. Our group has another run-in with a set of twins from Elizabeth Academy that also seem to have powers. One didn't really get a, a full public view of what they could do. Um, another has the power had the power of duplication, so they were able to split themselves off and create a dozen other little them's. Um, but Og Thalic and Theo were able to fight them off, and they ran. Um, and so the ver the last episode of kind of like this first story arc, this first six issue run as I'm kind of viewing it in my head, very much like comic books from our, the the big two kind of come in six issue runs. Um, the end of this first is issue run, Nat is faced with a situation where they're all in hiding using a secret underground bunker who uh, previously owned by Riley's dad. And... Um, they're hiding out in the bunker when Nat is faced with her parents and her, her grandmother and Nat and Theo's face have been on the television, on the news, kind of wanted for questioning related to the bus accident and, you know, not mentioned on TV, but you know, the potential <laughs> mental assault on a group of SWAT agents. Um, and Nat and Theo have been doing everything they could to stay away from that situation, understandably. Um, Nat's faced with her parents. They want to take her. They say they want to take her to the police station, and she willingly goes, sacrificing that situation in order to keep the rest of the group safe and unknown by Nat's parents and family. Unfortunately, Nat's parents didn't want to take her to the police they wanted to take her to main industry labs. It is a large privately owned drug and chemical company headquartered there in crown city run by seemingly a very, um, secluded and private, but gracious and, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? gracious with his money billionaire Jeffrey Maine and apparently while Nat thinks her parents work for um, in engineering in kind of mechanical work for a international conglomerate where they have to go back to the Netherlands to, to work and kind of work in and around the northern European states turns out while that might be true they at least in some part work for main industries drug lab and they want to take Nat to the lab outside of the city through some slew internet sleuthing and some brilliant kind of connections made with uh, Abby and with Adam. It turns out that there is a main lab facility very close to where Elizabeth Academy had their field day just a, a few days ago. And so the players have started making connections between what's happened to them and main labs. Nat has just found out about her parents possibly being involved and she has to ditch. She rolls out of a moving vehicle in the middle of downtown crown city and starts running for it. And she seems to be able to get away partially because she's able to, use her cell phone, call her teammates who were at actually at Nat's house trying to do some research. And everybody kind of comes to her rescue and is able to get her away. And they all hunker down in Theo's and his dad's apartment just outside of downtown Crown City. And they were just starting to settle in when a FBI agent came to the door asking to look and ask Theo some questions. Now, Theo knows that he's been 
on the news and is wanted for questioning. But he opens the door and basically tells the FBI agent, no warrant, no questions, and closes the door back in her face. But she seems pretty confident that she'll be able to get that warrant and come back. And so our, our group of students, potential heroes, are left hiding alone in Theo's apartment. It's been now just 48 hours after the initial event. And um, they're on the run, but looking into this main labs facility and they're, they're thinking, should we go and figure out exactly what's going on? And that's basically what's been happening in the, the first six episodes or issues of Young Heroes of Fate. Um, thank you so much to everybody that tunes in, whether you tune in live on the Encounter Roleplay Twitch channel Sundays at 5 p.m. Eastern to, to watch live with us and you're involved in chat. Um, donating in order to give players or me, the GM, fate points to help us kind of tell an even more dramatic story. Thank you so much. It's been this is my first experience streaming uh, RPG show. It's been so much fun getting to know you, the the fans and the watchers. If you listen on the podcast after the fact, thank you so much. That's kind of podcast is my. Uh, my baby and just outside of the game. I love podcasts and podcasting and I'm a big fan of RPG actual plays myself. And so being able to do that has been just a ton of fun. Um, I hope that you guys continue to enjoy the show. We want to keep doing it as long as we can. Um, we've got, you know, potentially at least this one, like one more story arc that I've got kind of built up in my head of, uh, but we'll see where the players go. I envisioned a much different game than the the one we're all getting to experience together, but I wouldn't have it any other way. I love each one of my players and their characters so much. I just love being able to play this game in front of you and um, help share this awesome game system in Fate Core that I don't feel enough people know about. And I think it makes for perfect uh, streaming and playing in front of an audience. So... Thank you so much. Um, if you are a fan and want to get kind of involved on the show, just if you're on Twitter, use the hashtag Young Heroes of Fate. Feel free to tag the the cast or, or me, tag Encounter RP. That's our channel that we play on. Let them know how much you're enjoying the show. If you're listening to us via the podcast, leave a review on iTunes. Even if you're not an iTunes user, leaving a review there actually just really does help um and gives great feedback for when we start talking with the channel about you know do we want to keep doing this it's great to get all that positive feedback um and feel free to reach out if you you know want to share something um thank you to all the artists out there who have shared their fan art of our show that is just so freaking cool and touches my heart and just little ways that you wouldn't even imagine that something we said or did on our show would inspire your artistic talents it just blows me away you guys are awesome um again sorry for uh missing a week but it, i think it fall into a perfect time between kind of big story arcs and i've got big big plans for this upcoming week and the the weeks after i think the game is going to ramp up and, and the drama is going to ramp up a lot for our our players and their characters so we'll see how everything goes thank you for watching we'll see you on sunday i don't have a good tagline so i'm just gonna end it there thanks see you soon